Netflix's I Came By begins with a young rebel without a cause breaking into the house of a rich man. He enters the house with different intentions, but by the time he leaves it, he is horrified beyond belief. As the story moves forward, we discover the flaws in the justice system as well as a streak of bad luck for regular people, while the criminal walks free among them. There are a lot of twists and turns in the story, which keeps the audience wondering what happens next. The tension builds steadily, and every character's life seems to be in jeopardy. You never know when the tables are going to turn on whom. The ending gives the audience a sense of closure, but some things are still left unanswered. Here we break down the ending and see what it means for the characters. Spoilers ahead. Who is Hector Blake? It's just a fire alarm at home, so uh, I better go and see to it. He is a judge who recently retired and is referred to as Saint Blake because of all the pro bono work he has done, especially in trying to assist asylum seekers. He represents justice and equality for everybody in the public eye. Sadly, he is also a complete sociopath. We are aware that Blake held prisoner at least one young man in his personal basement. Toby enters Blake's home and discovers him bruised and partially clothed. He decides to go back in the hopes of saving him. I Came By looks like it's going to be a movie about angry young man Toby, whose relationship with his mother is fractious and who has absolutely lost faith in a world he sees as corrupt, taking on Blake, rescuing his captive and proving to the world that he is worth something. But this isn't that movie. In the film's first big twist, Toby slips and is clonked on the head with a cricket bat by Blake. Later we get a glimpse of a possible motivation for why Blake is the way he is, or at least where his murderous urges first arose. Blake had a terrible father with whom he had no positive relationship. Blake's colonialist father, Toby references this earlier in the movie, hired a young Parsi man called Ravi as a helper who he eventually took under his wing and then into his bed, usurping his wife and son, who he abandoned, eventually leading to his mother's suicide, Blake was the first to find his dead mom. Blake tells his latest victim, an Iranian man named Ahmed, Yazdin Kafari, that he later beat Ravi to death kicking off his murderous obsession. Hector Blake. I'm arresting you for obstructing an officer. Okay. Why asylum seekers? Perhaps as a result of his extreme racism. Perhaps as a result of his experiences with Ravi and his horrible, bigoted father. However, it's also possible that he's an opportunist. He has access to these young men because of his reputation as an advocate for asylum seekers. He can interrogate them to determine how much their disappearance will be reported, and in the case of Ahmed, whom he drugs but who manages to escape, he can use threats to coerce into submitting his asylum application more quickly or more slowly. Ahmed is afraid that going to the police may negatively influence his application, so he won't. As a result, the very individuals who are meant to be guarding him are instead endangering him. And in this case actually murdering him. As a detail in a thriller it's neat. As the reality we are currently living it's incredibly troubling. How many people has Blake killed? Although it's unclear if Blake has had any victims prior to the man that Toby finds, it would seem that his preferred method of operation is to kidnap and hold a prisoner for torture and God knows what else, but there are very clear sexual undertones here, Bonneville playing against type is leeringly creepy, softly spoken and proper in a way that makes your skin crawl. Blake is forced to destroy the proof when he senses Toby is on him and eventually captures him. When Toby's mother Liz, Kelly McDonald, heartbreaking, calls the police, he kills both men and leaves the dungeon room spotless. Even though PC hunter, Marilyn Nadab, is incredibly suspicious of Blake and notices the peephole goes the wrong way they can't charge Blake due to his connections. He even takes a sly dig, closing the door for a second and whispering is that all you've got? I thought you were one of the clever ones is to taunt her. Later Blake attempts to make Ahmed his replacement prisoner. On his first attempt Ahmed escapes and is helped by Liz. But he's lured back by threats from Blake. As with her son, when Liz attempts to help, Blake kills both her and Ahmed. So that takes us to four during the movie's run time, plus Ravi makes five. Five murders and zero repercussions. Jay and a glimmer of hope, I came by is depressing and breaks several of the thriller genre's conventions. In the first part of the film, our main character is slain, although we don't know for sure until a little later, and his body is then burned and flushed down the toilet. Despite accumulating proof that Blake is the one who is in possession of her son, or at the very least knows where he is, his mother is unable to obtain justice. And when she visits Blake's residence on her own, as Blake had actually planned for her to do, she and Ahmed are both killed. He will continue to get away with it. The movie claims that this is how the planet is constructed. 
The powerful can do anything, the weak, the vulnerable, the marginalized, the poor, they are f But that's not the end. J. Priscilla Scott, best friend to Toby, decides he has to do something. He didn't accompany his friend when Toby first told him about Blake's basement because Jay's girlfriend was pregnant. He spent time in prison before and as a black man is acutely aware of how the police will view him. His commitment has to be to his family. But after subtly tipping Liz off by popping the letter to Blake he has stolen from his property into Toby's belongings, he feels the weight of her disappearance. She might not be blood, but she was as close as family to Jay. With his basement shenanigans compromised, Blake has packed up and moved house, leaving no obvious evidence pointing to what happened to Liz. But with help from his, now estranged, girlfriend Nas, Varada Sethu, Jay discovers Blake is attending a celebration and follows him home to his new place. Here he find another torture room with a new prisoner. Blake apprehends Jay, but this time Jay is able to overpower him, beating him up and leaving him tied up for the police to find. His last victim is alive, the evidence is overwhelming, and Blake will finally go down. Jay doesn't wait for the police to arrive, nevertheless, he does leave a final memorial to Toby and Liz, and a message to other strong predators, I came by painted in large letters on the wall. Despite all, Jay may still wind up facing charges. Terrible people who have strong connections will work hard and succeed. However, a courageous person can occasionally make a difference. No matter how hopeless things seem, the movie advises never giving up.